pet for the people uh, my name is meghna and uh, i lead the uh, lashin group uh, from the delhi uh, and gurgaon we have folks uh, of noida uh, leaders as well and then yes, uh, a group of people who you know come and join us on every weekend and spend some time with us a little chit chat and a little bit of learning so guys we have jason he is from atlashin and he'll share some of uh, his experience uh, with agile uh, with us today so go on jason so yeah, fantastic thank you yeah um i was looking on the map is the the delhi and noida regions are to, uh, side by side is that is that they yeah, yeah they they're really close almost the same region <laughs> oh wow wow so 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 large you've got um so you can have so so many different communities going on there um cool um i can record this can i is this is this what, uh, yes sure it? sure i am doing it for everybody but you can do it uh for yep. yourself as well okay i think it's already saying it's recording so I'll, i might leave it there for okay. you and i'll um yeah i'll get you to look at that yeah. i don't want to touch anything that might might break it <laughs> okay you want to you want me to just get it go into it um it, the presentation will probably go for um almost an hour so um, i'll try and move through stuff i and uh see if we can get some q a going as well um because obviously it's a it's a pretty um meaty subject uh so yeah, without further ado i'll i'll, uh, I'll kick off eh? okay so Share my screen. Oh, uh, I think you'll need to enable screen sharing or uh, uh, make me the uh, presenter. Because when I share, share screen, it says hosts disabled attendee screen sharing. How about now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So you see, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. We can. Okay. So I'll just minimize Zoom. Okay, awesome. Well, again, thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak to you all. Um, it's, uh, un, you know, under unfortunate circumstances, we are um, not able to, to fly in and actually join you face to face as we like to do with the uh, community events and, uh, and, and meet you all in person. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, being able to dial in and, and do this is, 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 is pretty cool. And again, thank you for taking your Sundays uh, to um, uh, to come come to the event and listen to this talk. Um, so yeah, my name is Jason Wong. I'm a principal product manager at Atlassian. Um, I've been with the uh, company about six and a half years and uh, I live and work in Sydney. Uh, this is my family um, uh, self-isolating uh, um, at uh, the primary school I used to go to. I live in the southern area of Sydney, the Southern Shire. And um, been doing product management for about 15 years. I've, I've worked at uh, large, small companies as well, Yahoo in the past, um, e-commerce shopping sites, those sort of things. Uh, and um, and uh, what brought me to Atlassian, I was, I was using a lot of you know, Jira, Confluence, uh, to, as I worked in um, a couple of companies and sort of had a, had a um, bit of a, a passion for uh, trying, you know, obviously uh, an idea of where I, I think I could uh, help and contribute, I guess. And I started my career as the uh, lead product manager for Jira Agile. So those of you who followed our company for all would have known Jira. We, we brought that out to market in the early 2000s and it was a bug tracker um, for many years and then Agile sort of uh, took on and we, you know, we um, looked to upgrade our, our Agile tracking capabilities. Uh, with the purchase of a, a, a plugin that was on the Elastic Marketplace called Green Hopper, and then we, we rebrand that to Jira Agile. So I came into the scene uh, about 2014, um, Jira Agile, and for about five years, I was the lead product manager. We, we saw that through to uh, what, what you hear now is uh, Jira Software. We, uh, you know, we, we brought Jira Agile from a plugin, combined it with Jira, made it a, a fully fledged offering for Agile teams, and um, right through to uh, 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 releasing the, um, the new Jira a couple of years back with the new next gen projects in there. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been very, very fortunate to have met a lot of our customers doing, uh, running agile projects, managing agile teams, looking at how they can, can sort of get better with agile. So, uh, yeah, again, very fortunate to hear a lot of stories, see, let's see those teams. So what, what I'll uh, try and do with this presentation is to share with you some of those, um, stories, uh, some of the, um, team examples from inside of Atlassian and some frameworks, hopefully that, that will help with that. So. Um, one, you know, one guiding principle we had when we were developing Jira and Jira software is uh, really recognition that no teams are going to work the same way because every team in their situation is going to be very different and you need to adjust that to the different customers, the different 
uh, products you're working on, the different culture, the different, uh, you know, the technology that you're dealing with as well. Uh, and that's, how, that's why we've built so much configurability into Jira. And it's great to see our customers uh, take advantage of that. And, uh, you know, this is, the, you know, seeing what our customers are doing, the awesome apps and software and services and businesses they turn out is, is sort of my inspiration why, why I come to Elastian every day and try and help, uh, help you do more of that amazing stuff. Very exciting to see tech changing the world. So um, the retro in, on Agile, I actually gave this talk uh, originally in February uh, this year at a, a conference called Developer Summit Tokyo. It's the last uh, overseas trip I, I did before we, we all got locked down. Um, but uh, it, was, it was sort of a bit of a homecoming in many ways in Japan. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the, I, I gave this talk actually in Japanese. So I, my family is actually from Malaysia. My, my background's not Japanese, but I, I learned Japanese at, at high school. My, my wife is Japanese, so we try and speak Japanese in the house. So it was more, it was this thing to, to, to try, uh, challenge myself to do a second language presentation. Um, but also Agile is recognized to have sort of originated from Japan. Uh, in um, in the 80s and there was a seminal paper called the new new product development game by professors Takeuchi and Nonaka who were talking about how Japanese companies were uh, getting good products to market very quickly and observing how they uh, develop products and and sort of resembling a little bit how, uh, how the game of uh, rugby union is played with the overlapping phase scrums sort of thing going and that's where that's where the terminology scrum sort of came from but interestingly, Japan never uh, really put it into software development. Uh, they, you know, it was, it's very much been at the heart of manufacturing, the electronics industry. But software, uh, agile, still, still uh, yet to, to, to penetrate and, uh, in, in, and get widespread adoption in Japan. Although that, that has been changing. Uh, but really, it was it wasn't until February the thirteenth, two thousand and one, when uh, a bunch of you know eminent software leaders gathered at this ski lodge in Utah. Uh, famously came up with the Agile Manifesto. And then from there on, we, uh, we've, we've seen what, what happened there. You know, it's become the, uh, uh, the most popular way, uh, preferred way to develop software around the world. Um, so a lot of time has passed since, since this time uh, when it came into the software world, let alone back in the 80s when, when some of the thinking emerged. Uh, and so you know, we thought it'd be a good, good idea to look at what's changed, uh, what, what are, how has Agile gone for, for everyone. And, more so as well, like, you know, our product Jira software was there to help teams, you know, uh, you know, um, support them running uh, agile projects. And so, you know, we thought, why not run a, a retro on agile? It might help us get an idea of what, what, what uh, the industry needs and how we improve our product going forward. So this campaign of retro and agile was that was born and uh, simply it is really that thing. You know, just let's, let's, let's ask people how their experience has gone, what they, what they like, what they wish it could do. Uh, and also the possibilities. What if it did? What if it did this? And, and hopefully we can sort of also address what what where Agile needs to head towards in the future. So we launched the campaign at Web Summit. Uh, I think it's the world's largest IT conference uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. And this this was around the end of 2017. And we you can see at the the back there we cr created a huge physical wallboard, and you can see people writing on these uh, magnetic cards that they could then you know put into each of the columns. Give us feedback about Agile. A lot of it, over, obviously, overlapping with with Jira software, um, trying to help them uh, with their Agile practices. And uh, fantastic conversation and engagement. Really, really um, great kickoff. And uh, we've been running that at other conferences as well. This is the most recent one from Japan back in in February. A lot of interaction. A lot of people. Um, yeah, it's a great conversation starter um, and something a bit bit interactive at the booth. Uh, I think we actually won the won the booth award uh, at at Developer Summit. Uh, which is great, but um, you know, there's only so many you can do, but with people passing through conferences, and you can only beat so many conferences. So we went to the Twitter sphere uh, to crowdsource it from the Agile worldwide community, and we got about th over three and a half thousand tweets come through. So really great uh, engagement. Although it did make it a whole lot of uh, work to try and um, curate and try and find groupings around this. I think there's a page inside Atlassian. On, on our Confluence instance, which is probably one of the heaviest pages, is, is showing all the cards we've collected physically and digitally. Uh, yeah, so, um, so what were the sort of themes that came out from it? I'm not going to do justice on this, to be honest. It's, there are so many uh, great sort of conversations, as you can imagine, over you know, 4,000 artifacts that it would have to sort of sift through. Um, I've chosen three, uh, just as I sort of feel fairly, they're, they're fairly um, important things to confront. Um, as with any as as with any retro, we're going to focus on the things that we want to improve on. So there's going to be a bit of a uh, a self-critical type um, 
uh, mood to this presentation. Um, but uh, let, let's see, let's see the themes I still like to address here. Uh, there were a lot of people uh, noticing that agile has lost its meaning. It's become to mean many things to many different people, uh, and that's a problem because uh, you know it, 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 uh, it, things are taken out of context. People aren't sort of you know potentially not getting or aligned on, on how they're working. Um, particularly, uh, there are a lot of people um, expressing you know, struggles with uh, having management understand uh, how agile projects are run. There's a lot of people asking for continuous improvement. They just want to have more practice, you know, what more ideas, practices, examples. Again, I'll try and do that today with some 10 examples. Excellent to see this, you know, it's at the heart of the agile spirit, um, looking for continuous improvement. And also there was a lot of uh, teams worried about uh, the health, the impact on, the, on, on health. There is, uh, you know, I sort of putting in their comments around, oh look, there's a lot of focus on metrics, you know, like burn down and velocity, cycle time. And, uh, but, you know, looking at that too much and not worrying about the team. Now, at least the first two there are, um, you know, I, I think those things can be solved with some, some education and experience. Uh, the third one there about team health is a lot harder. I mean, it's a, that's a culture problem. Uh, again, I'll, I'll do, do my best to try and uh, unpack that for you as we run, walk, walk through this. So what I thought we'd do is, uh, as you know, sort of to also um, give you some of those examples and answer those themes that came out of the Retro and Agile, uh, to actually also walk through the, uh, the examples I'm going to give you and frameworks using the actual Agile Manifesto itself. Um, I'm sure you all know these, so I'm going to have to read them out. Uh, hopefully, if we've all been using them in some way and found them of benefit, I've, I've found them hugely uh, powerful throughout my career, and I think they're, they're still going to be uh, there for a very, very long time. Um, now, starting with the first thing, I, I, I normally uh, like to sort of make clarify that the, the Agile Manifesto is, has two sides to the equation. Um, you know, very much what we're saying is we, we want to do both, but we do prefer the things on the left to the things over the right. Um, but very often I do see the stuff on the right forgotten or the stuff on the right falling off. Uh, and uh, if you don't believe me, let's have a look at a, an example with this one, responding to change, over following a plan. Out on the internet, you'll see a lot of uh, jokes about Agile, um, such as this one here. Hey, we didn't have a strategy. We kept changing our minds and we failed repeatedly. Let's just tell management we're, we're just being Agile. And so Agile has been sometimes a bit of a joke as to like uh, uh, an excuse for never having to deliver anything. I'm not sure how many of you would have seen that um, come around, but um, I, so, I certainly have in my time. You know, I, I, I do hear things like, hey, we don't need a plan, we're agile. We don't ship to dates, we're agile. We just ship whenever we're ready. Um, but I, I didn't, you know, that's not actually what agile is about. This, it, agile definitely does have commitment into there. And uh, you know, it is not a license to just do random, random program. In fact, you know, if you forget about the other side of the, the, the balance of this uh, principle here, um, over following a plan, you still need to have a plan. It doesn't say you don't need to have a plan because if you don't have a plan, no one knows where you're going. It's hard to get alignment on your strategy and, and uh, you know, it, it, no one really knows what's happening. So um, so what do we do about this? I sort of looked for some uh, inspiration on, on, on the other side and thought about this building here. I don't know if anyone knows this building. It's the um, Sagrada, Sagrada Familia in, in Barcelona, an absolutely amazing um, building. You've got to go and see it if you, if you have the opportunity. Now this building started construction in 1882, and it's uh, it's actually still not complete. You believe it or not? And according to TripAdvisor, it's the world's most visited building. So by any measure, this this incomplete building is, uh, you know, probably one of the most successful, if not the most successful, building in the world in terms of construction and architecture. Um, and so what you know, we, what we also need to to do here and to be in a position to be able to respond to change, uh, is to is to be always you know, getting getting our our uh, products out early, as early as possible uh, in, in real life conditions into customers' hands, right? We, uh, you know, th there's, there's a lot of benefit from testing and doing all these things um, to try and reduce that risk, uh, but there's nothing beats getting it into the customer's hands where it actually gets used in, in, in that day-to-day -day real environment, not, not artificial data. Um, and so really there's a strong connection with the next uh, principle here, you know, and really getting to this position of, of having working software over comprehensive documentation. And um, to, to give an example of, of this uh, principle, I, I decided to uh, bring up a team example from inside Atlassian. This is the uh, Cladix team in Atlassian Identity. They build a lot of our, uh, our login systems in cloud and, uh, and they, they often have a lot of uh, compliance deadlines. So they have to work in an ag agile way 
with a lot of deadlines that, you know, if they miss, you've got, you've got legal implications, which are, which are um, normally, normally you can't negotiate on that time frame. So, uh, so this story comes from the team lead, the gentleman sitting in the front right there, uh, Aman King. And what Aman King was telling me, he's always got this sort of struggle with, you know, he's always asked, hey, uh, when can you deliver that by when? I think everyone gets asked that question, to be honest. And he was telling me, hey, Jason, look, I, look, I could spend time trying to come up with an estimate, but if I if I just if we just sit sit there and and do a, an estimation, it's all going to be bad. If you know, to, to be honest, rubbish. Um, so what he what he what he was telling me is he wants to what he tends to do is try and uh, get the team some experience. And so what, what he typically likes to do is start by doing a a coding spike, uh, which means you know just jump into the into the code. They've got an idea of what needs to change, but really the first couple of weeks is really just getting in there, getting familiar with the code, uncovering some unknowns and really getting some experience there. So, you know, at the start of the project, they're tracking things on a wallboard uh, like this and it's a bit hard to understand what, what's actually going on. They're just telling each other what they're doing and it's not really organized at this point in time. Uh, but over a few weeks later, what, what's going on here is the team has now actually built up uh, experience in the code base and uh, experience trying to solve it as well with, with the throwaway code during the coding spike. And as you can see, there's, it's now taking the shape of a, a plan, which is now based on real experience. You can see sprints forming, there's tracks, different things. And on the far right, you can see, uh, you know, there are different, definite uh, commitments and, uh, and forecasting now going on as to when they'll, they believe they'll, uh, what they will deliver and when. And uh, what Iman was telling me is now this plan is actually, uh, you know, it's not estimates that are sort of guesses, they're actual, that they're, they're, they're again made with his team who now has experience. And so he, what, he, what he tells me is that uh, the benefit of this is he can, um, he can get a sense of the directory and risk and progress earlier and have conversations with stakeholders about, hey, okay, if that deadline is fixed, uh, we, you know, we need to either drop scope or we need to increase some resources, have that, have that earlier so there are no nasty surprises at the end. Um, and he said this is a great technique for uncovering unknowns that, uh, or, might be hiding in there or literally monsters. The team got sort of carried away and went into this next level of, of tracking. This is this is Aman's team's warboard that uh, I think was inspired by Pokemon Go. And what you're seeing here is, uh, you know, all the little cards lined up there are, are, are like issues and they're lined up in along the critical path towards the goal. You can see the trophy down the bottom right. And, um, and you can see the dotted lines there are, are denoting uh, soft dependencies. And where the cards run into each other, they're, they're, they signify hard dependency. So, you, you know, in, in order for you to proceed, the preceding two paths have to, have to, have to be uh, finished where they merge, otherwise you can't, can't go ahead. Um, another feature of this warboard is these Pokemon monsters. I don't know if anyone knows Pokemon Go, um, but apparently you're going catching monsters and they represent uh, epics or milestones so the, the cards before them are, are the children of those epics that uh, go into those and then the team had this thing where that once they uh, achieve that um, epic or milestone capture that pokemon they grab a pokeball and uh, that gives them the ability to go have a bit of a team celebration a coffee on the on the on the company or something like that just to make sure they're um you know and also have, having a bit of fun while they do this uh, another feature of this wallboard over on the far right is what is known as Credo and Atlassian. So these, it's, a, it's a set of procedures, things and practices that help us, uh, you know, achieve high performance and availability when we're running cloud services. So that the cards sitting in, in Credo are sitting in that, that, that stream. They want the stream to be always running, you know, nice and fresh, uh, always ticking along, not, 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 not a, in a healthy state. And the cards there are just people going and, and highlighting risks uh, and or noning down work that needs to go into that performance and scale sort of piece. Um, so real big benefit of this, you know, we talk about the water cooler effect where people just get together in the office. Uh, and we're sure we're trying to find out how to do that in this COVID environment because we're not, not in the office physically. Um, but this is sort of that turbocharge because, you know, it's not just a random conversation. Everyone, this is in the office environment. And what he found is his team just tends to hang around here, talk about them. People come up with their own risks. Everyone's thinking about progress and it's it's really helped this team become uh, build up a, a really strong reputation to come for being able to deliver really hard projects uh, as committed uh, the team has other examples famously around I don't know if anyone knows the game lemmings I think it was a game from the 80s or 90s where you got these little critters walking around you got to try and stop them from falling off the cliff uh, another theme here with the, the lemmings uh, path to get to the uh, um, goal and then you can see on the left there the credo waterfall again that uh, all the work and, and stuff and risks highlighted needed to run 
cloud services robustly. Another interesting wallboard here, I think the team uh, was feeling passionate about the environment. So, you know, different cards and issues about on their different environments, they park some things in the park bench and then releases and deployments over there. So a few fun for, sort of wallboards uh, for the team to have here, but real, really uh, the, the, the story I wanted to tell you here was like, it's just, it's a balance, right? You've seen here, Aman getting in there quickly, st straight to working software, but he's also come back with a really uh, you know, no novel way to, to track and have actually show a plan and have that plan uh, really help them um, with their execution. Um, but really, it comes back to this, this principle here, you know, working software over comprehensive documentation. Uh, and I've seen many great agile teams adopt the, this saying here, working software uh, really is our best, me best, be best measure of progress. So, you know, when you're struggling, you're feeling there's too much em emphasis on the cycle times and the burn downs, you know, really getting to working software, seeing those milestones um, is, 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 you know, really where the rubber hits the road, where things are real. Um, in, in all of my uh, roadmaps that I set and the release strategies, I'll always have a very high, uh, high preference to making sure we've got um, iterative working software plans and releases there, because um, that's when all the, all the validation really comes together and the team can see where we're, where we're on track and where we're not uh, in terms of what the customer needs. So uh, next uh, principle, this is my favorite one, individuals, interactions, over processes and tools. Uh, so um, let's start this one with a, uh, a bit of feedback from Jackie here at the Retro and Agile. I wish more companies and people understood that Agile can be other methodologies besides Scrum. Now, I think this is probably one of the biggest misunderstandings of, of Agile, uh, this thing here where uh, I think Agile is seen to be Scrum, you know, doing the stand-ups, doing the estimation, doing the retrospective, just those ceremonies. I think we've all heard that many times going, that is actually not Agile. Uh, but more so, Agile is actually not a process. Scrum is a process and a framework. Uh, it's really a software development mindset or a philosophy. You know, you don't do agile, you actually be agile. Um, and so the difference here was that yeah, Scrum is a great process and framework that sort of helps you um, embrace the agile philosophy and it has iterations built into it so you can respond to change, uh, those sort of things, right? So, um, yeah, the, the stories and all that sort of stuff tries to get people talking about it um, and, and, and uh, getting those individual interactions over um, you know, the processes or, and other things. And, and so, um, so it helps. And, you know, the way I like to explain it is a little bit like, um, you know, using the, uh, using sport as an example, you know, you can uh, look, if you look at the game of rugby union, you know, there is a, uh, there's a set template, right? You've got a certain specification for the field uh, where things are, you know, the sidelines, the goal area, the, the 22 lines and those things. And so when you've created this game, it's that template. Scrum, the Scrum framework is, is like that, right? And so there's a, there's a lot of people who play this game. There's over 100 countries who play rugby union. You can have a World Cup. I'm not sure how popular rugby is in, in, uh, in India. Um, I do know that we, we all love cricket. So it's similar to cricket, right? Like a, we, we, everyone knows this great game. There's a lot of countries that play it. We can have a, have a World Cup and have a great tournament. Um, but if you were to choose a different sort of framework, you know, a game like this, I don't know if anyone knows what this game is by looking at it. Uh, it's this game we play in Australia, in the state of Victoria, called Australian Rules Football. It's a bit of a, if you watched it, it, it would look like a mix of soccer because everyone's all over the place. The ball is an oval, so it's a bit like rugby. It is a contact sport, uh, but you score, you score points a little bit like basketball in a, in a sense. You, know, you can dribble the ball and, and that sort of thing. But even then, like even where I live in, in Australia, in Sydney, in the state of New South Wales, getting a game of AFL going just casually is going to be hard because a lot of people actually still don't know how to play that, play it properly. Victorians, however, love this, mad about it. It's like a religion. Um, but why am I talking about this? Um, you know, when we talk about team performance, how you, how you sort of build an agile team and move it towards a higher, you know, the high performance side of the curve, you start with a framework that no one knows. You're going to start right at the bottom. It's not that it's not, uh, you can't do this, but, you know, just bear in mind, everyone's going to have to learn how to play the game together, let alone get good at it. Uh, whereas so we go with the world's most well-known software development methodology, Scrum, uh, you can start higher up the curve because it, there's a higher chance that people have experience with it. And if not, there's, there's a lot of great training and literature out there. Uh, but the point I want to make here is Scrum is a great starting point. It's not actually going to get you to the top of the curve. So you'll start further up because hopefully people sort of know how to play the game. But as with any team coming together, you have to get to know each other. And so you run your retros and you will feel a bit of a, a uh, you know, performance dive. And from those retros, what, you, what you're supposed to be doing is like, like talking about the, the things that have worked, what haven't worked, and making tweaks. And where you, what you want to get to is actually have those tweaks uh, move into what actually suits your, 
your team. Like I was, I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, you know, we believe with Jira, we, we customize it because every team is, is different and, and have different performance needs. And so similar to Aman King's Cloud X team, you know, they've, they've gone and tweaked their specific way of working. Again, they've got a, a lot of these legal, you know, compliance requirements, um, a lot of security and, you know, user, user management data, you know, that's, it's no joke if, if something goes wrong with that. Um, and so you can see they've tweaked it and transcended the framework Scrum and gone into their own thing. I don't know how to describe what, what they do. It's not, is it Scrum, is it Kanban? Uh, is it Scrum, Scrum Ben? Is it Pokemon Go or Lemmings? You know, but they've, they've figured that way out, right? And that, that's really the key to, to move and I guess stand on the shoulders of Scrum and, and, and adjust to your own way of working to actually find that, that high performance that suits you need. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, uh, you know, different software development methodologies that are sort of competing for the best way of developing software. Agile and Waterfall comes up a lot. And it's, it's probably not the, the greatest way to compare things because as I mentioned, Agile is not a process. So you're comparing a philosophy with a process. But this question comes up, so we've got to sort of deal with it. And it's a little bit like, the good guy versus the bad guy conversation. Um, you know, it's sort of, who doesn't want to be the good agile guy? You know, and, uh, you know, if you sort of um, uh, look at the agile itself, like who doesn't want to say they're agile? This, like, I've been through uh, quite a few um, conferences with the, with the company and the product, and every time we set something up, we, uh, we have a lot of T-shirts to give away, you know, come and fill out a survey and we'll give you a T-shirt. And of all the T-shirts we brought to all the conferences I've been through the years, this T-shirt just flew off the, the shelves like, faster than any other t-shirt there. I mean, everyone wanted to, um, wanted this t-shirt. It's pretty, pretty cool to say, I'm agile, even if you're not. And, and so uh, there is this sort of thing where, um, you know, uh, again, agile's come to mean different things and, and maybe some confusion as to what it is. If you look closer here, it's sort of the bad guy pretending to be the, the good guy. And you hear this out in the marketplace, right? People saying, hey, uh, you know, that's waterfall in disguise in, in, as, as, uh, when, when things don't go well. Um, but I do want to bring us back to this discussion here. So individuals and interactions uh, over process and tools. And so if you think about that principle from, from an agile mindset, it, it can actually be um, plausible that an agile team would actually do waterfall. So if you think about that, again, it's that balance and thinking about the philosophies here, whatever works for the team, the individuals and interactions, the processes can, can come second. Uh, let me sort of explain this to you because I think I think some people when I say that they might think that's sacrilege. Like an agile guy saying you can do waterfall. That's that's uh, uh, I can't believe you just said that. But um, what I want to do is introduce to you this framework called Kinefin, and it's a it's a it's been around for a while, but it's one that I found really really useful to explain what I'm going to explain here about individual interactions over processes and tools, and agile versus waterfall. Um, but I found this also very powerful things like story pointing. It's a complexity diagnosis framework. And what it's trying to do is get you to understand what kind of uh, problem, the complexity of the problem you're up against. So this is the way the uh, framework works. In the bottom right, you've got um, this, these sort of simple type um, problems. So simple type problems are ones that we've seen before. Uh, you know, we've, we've solved it many times before. You can see examples out there. People might say things like there's best practice out there. And if you think about, uh, you know, sort of day-to-day -day example, um, you know, McDonald's fries is an example of this. They've perfected how to make fries anywhere in the world. You go anywhere, any McDonald's anywhere in the world and it'll taste really awesome. Um, now this is a sort of thing where they've, there's best practice, you know, there's a really cut way, way they've sourced the chips, cut them, everything. You know, you don't want to go to McDonald's and have the team there uh, experimenting with it, you know, become too salty, they'll burn it or undercook it, whatever's going on. And so these kind of simple problems, best practice are best done with waterfall. You don't want that variation. You want to make sure that best practice is applied. And the top right here, we've got complicated problems. These are ones where there are many different ways to solve the problem. They're all good. Uh, you just need to pick them. Sometimes picking them is, is a hard uh, task, um, trying to get alignment and agreement on that. So uh, a good, good practice here is to get some subject matter experts to come in and uh, you know, help you evaluate that and make, make a decision. Um, an example in our day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, if anyone's been to Japan, um, it'll probably, you would have heard this, uh, um, this, these bullet trains, um, actually, I'm not sure of the right, but I, I might have heard that they're actually going to bring them to India. Um, but the, the two largest cities in, in Japan, Tokyo and Osaka, um, when you travel between those two, if you go and visit there, um, or you'll, you'll, you'll probably come across the situation. It's like, should we go by a train or bullet train, uh, sorry, plane or bullet train? And I can tell you probably the bullet train's going to win, actually, in terms of uh, time and, 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 and anyway. But um, the, the idea here, anyway, there's different ways to get from A to B, right? It's just really 
evaluate what fits your criteria, choose and go. Sometimes you use Agile, sometimes Waterfall. Now on the left here, top left, we've got complex problems. These are ones that we've never seen before. We can't really find a, a precedent or someone else having solved the problem. So there's a lot of unknowns going on here. Uh, but more so, these kind of problems are characterized by uh, the, the, the fact that you can't really uh, analyze the thing up front and, and, and solve it by thinking about it and analyzing it. You have to really put, put something into the system, see how the system responds, and then you'll, you might be able to then figure out uh, a way to solve the problem. Uh, and so, you know, again, in our day-to-day, -day, sport is a great example of this, you know. Uh, you know, you want, when, you, when you're playing a, a team sport, you know, you, you want to be, uh, you know, looking at what the, your opponent's doing as a team, um, trying different things, doing a bit of trial and error, mixing up your game. If you have a static game plan, you're going to lose, right? So, uh, again, Agile does this really well. Um, it's very experimental. It's iterative. It helps you uncover those uh, unknowns um, and, and uh, uh, conquer the problem. On the bottom left, we've got chaotic problems. These are sort of like natural disasters. We had some pretty uh, bad, very, very bad uh, bushfires in Australia earlier this year. And then straight after that, the coronavirus all fit into these sort of things, these, these sort of um, disasters where you just got to get out of the situation as fast as possible. Don't try and optimize for things. Um, you know, sort of do, do, do that a bit later on. Like, you know, same with the coronavirus, you know, the, the only thing, we haven't got a vaccination going. So, uh, best thing is to try and quarantine if possible and self-isolate. Uh, in software, these are like incidents, right? Something goes down, uh, don't try and optimize for it. Just try and get the service back up and running. We'll do our post and incident review later on. Uh, people love using Kanban here because it lets us, uh, you know, respond to things in the moment. Again, get out of that problem and then optimize later on as we go. Now, a big feature of this framework in the center here is uh, the um, disorder cliff. And what this cliff is, is sort of trying to... Uh, represent is what happens when you get the the type of problem and its complexity not matched with the approach so for example if you had a complex problem that does require experimentation because a lot of unknowns uh, and again it's one of those that you have to push something in the system before you understand the problem um, but you know the team's not allowed to practice uh, iteration and, and experimentation they're asked to just do it Hey, that's simple. Just, 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 just. Uh, what they, what, what's happening here is they're being asked to solve a complex problem using a waterfall way. You can't cross that that cliff, that disorder cliff, and so they fall down that, not get the results, and a lot of frustration comes through. Um, you can you can give an example the other way around as well, right? You might have uh, someone does actually have experience here. They do know that there's a solution out there. It's a simple problem, but then you get this sort of behaviour where teams say they're agile and they'll, they'll experiment on all the things, and they can never beat that best practice. Again, they'll try and cross that cliff. They can't uh, know, you know, get the results you want and then a lot of frustration and bad, bad uh, team health. Um, so that's Kennefin. Um, you know, it's sort of, I guess, what you can see from here is the more unknown unknowns you have in your, uh, either your technology or your customer requirements, uh, you know, you're sort of going anti-clockwise up around this. Uh, Agile, Agile is, a lot, is, is very powerful. And we, we, we tend to see this a lot in software development because we're not generally, you know, uh, good at sort of upfront specking software. Um, but also, you know, that's, that's to be said, as you uncover these unknown unknowns, uh, there is a bit of a tendency to try and push things clockwise back. There's less unknowns and you, and you try and uh, reduce uh, um, variation and stuff like that. So again, this is sort of the conversation I just wanted to sort of put there and show you this, this framework because, you know, there are times when you might want to actually do waterfall or agile. Um, you know, one thing I've seen, you know, uh, comments I've heard in teams many times is, uh, throughout the years I've worked is, is wor this worry about never coming back and iterating on something. Um, and, and so, you know, are we actually uh, doing our best job? Are we actually putting the right thing forward? Are we proud to ship this thing? And so what, again, what I found is with Kennefin is it's a good way to just talk about why we're going to iterate on some things and invest in those problems and perhaps less in the other things because we can't iterate on all the things uh, and be, be commercially viable. Um, okay. to, uh, to you know interrupt there's a question okay. from uh, one of the participants it says that uh, in the earlier chart you showed that uh, kanban was in the chaotic zone so yes. isn't the kanban a variant of agile only what's what different it has with then of a complex agile cliff oh there's probably overlap from that sorry if that wasn't clear i mean you could be using Kanban in the Agile frameworks in that in those areas. As, uh, sorry, Kanban for those Agile frameworks as well. Yep. Okay. Um, it's just I guess I guess when you when you look at incident management, you do tend to see teams prefer 
you probably won't see them going into a scrum pattern because that's like a two week holding pattern. Whereas when you're in an incident, again, it's chaos, everything's on fire. Um, you know, coronavirus thing, you're not going to spend two weeks <laughs> out something and then trying that you're going to just, you have to, so Kanban's nice because it lets you move fully in the moment. But yeah, it, it didn't mean that Kanban is only in that bottom left. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. No worries. Cool. All right. Um, and then customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> I don't know how to sort of explain this contract situation. Uh, other than to make the observation that, you know, traditional contracts uh, do have a lot of, of uh, get, do get in the way of collaboration. And that's because they, they're normally there to protect the customer. There's a lot of penalties that you put in there to try and stop the vendor for, you know, from doing things they shouldn't be doing or, or not delivering. Uh, and that's the thing, not delivering. So um, a lot of risk on one side and the return on the other side is not, it's not high in this, in this scale. It's actually very light, so you don't get a lot of value. So we want to have something that's a bit more aligned and that's where we try and try and get this principle to have collaboration over the contract so that we've, we've got aligned incentives and hopefully get a better risk return outcome. Um, some of you may have seen the Alassian Health Monitor. We, we launched this at uh, one of our summits a few years back. It's, it's uh, like a retrospective, but an agile res retrospective tends to be around what you're building and how you're building. Uh, this is more of a retrospective on the team health. So you can see some, some of the things we'll do a retrospective on are things like, do we understand who the full-time owner is? Do we have a balanced team? Do we have a shared understanding of the customer problem? And, and so forth. And so what you're trying to do is get an understanding of the team uh, is set up for success from a health perspective. So you can see there's nothing here about, are we, how are we building? We've got the right tools or anything like that. Um, and what we're building, it's very much about the team, the team health. Um, the way it works is quite simple as well. Um, you know, you sort of put thumbs up, uh, put a fist for like, meh, sort of not sure, and then thumbs down if, if you think the thing's not healthy. Uh, and then we sort of, you know, it's like playing rocks, papers and scissors. It's like, hey, do we have a shared understanding of the customer problem? One, two, three, and then everyone should try and give their opinion at the same time. Again, like, you know, not going, not trying to bias each other. Uh, and um, and that gives us an uh, you know a view as to whether the team is is doing you know, uh, is healthy in this this area. And there's many ways to run this. Uh, this is a photo of my team back in uh, the day running uh, a team health model on a a ball board. Um, you can also use a uh, Confluence template, uh, team health monitor template, and this is great for tracking uh, you know trends. You know you can see that it's got dates along there, uh, so you can see whether we're trending up or down on, on health in, in certain areas. And also it's great for noting down actions that we want to take to try and improve the health of uh, each of those attributes. Uh, Trello is also very popular for running a team health monitor, particularly with remote teams. So it might be a really good, uh, probably the, the choice to use right now as we work remotely. Uh, it does have re real time uh, features in there on the boards, right? So uh, as soon as you put your card down, it, it'll, it'll sync everywhere. Um, now, it, like any retrospective, you can't talk about all the cards. And so what, what we tend to um, recommend is, is for you to look at the areas where uh, you know, the results came out very different. Um, so it sort of shows that there's something going on here in terms of either the understanding or there's, there's a problem. Uh, and so we like to try and prioritize time spent talking, on, uh, talking about these, these ones where they're different. Um, and hopefully that helps us you know, figure out what actions we want to take to try and get that health uh, um, working better across the team. Uh, the other part with uh, you know, collaboration, how do we get collaboration going well? And there's, there's a story here I want to bring from my current role in um, the uh, Alaskan Cloud Platform Migrations team. Uh, and we're, we're a team that is, spans the whole world. We've got people wanting to move to cloud. I don't know if in, in your uh, your day to day jobs, uh, the, the whole the whole movement to cloud is huge for the industry. Uh, for all sorts of benefits and reasons. Um, and our, our, our team works globally. We've got teams in Austin, uh, San Francisco, Sydney, uh, and uh, Bengaluru, as well as our support teams in, in, in Amsterdam. Uh, so um, this is a story about uh, you know, trying to help our customers move from, from server to cloud. Uh, many of you who know our products would know that our, our, our core products, Jira and Confluence, uh, had been the same for, me, for a long time. We, we did fork the code base uh, about three years ago. And um, this, they're starting to become um, a bit more different, but generally they're, 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 uh, uh, they've got a very long um, history of being the same. Um, now we've also built a rich ecosystem. You know, we can get apps and download them for our server products. 
and uh, also cloud. Now, one thing to call out here is our, the way the apps are built in server and cloud, unlike Jira and, and Confluence, are completely different. Uh, and so when we talk about moving to cloud, our customers want to move to, to a cloud um, strategy, uh, we have a, a situation where the applications either don't have an equivalent in cloud or you can't actually migrate them. Uh, and this is causing a lot of, a lot of problems uh, in terms of enabling customers to move to cloud. So um, a number of these uh, brands here are very successful uh, app developers on the Alaskan marketplace. And uh, some of them are contacting us going, hey, we need to move to cloud. We've both got this problem. Can we come and work with you? So one of them said, hey, let's, can we come and hang out with you? And I was like, sure, come and come, come down to our office and we're, we're happy to spend a week with you because we want to figure this out too. Um, so uh, that, that sort of happened and all of a sudden the you know, developers from these five companies came and I had a bit of a problem, which is like, I don't know how I can have five different conversations with different vendors who compete with each other in, in, uh, in the Alaskan marketplace and try and solve this problem. Um, so what we did was uh, turn this an opportunity to run a hackathon for a week. So, uh, so what we did here was um, go into a WeWork office in Sydney and and yeah, like try try and say, hey, look, sure, we've got these relationships where we've been selling things on Atlassian Marketplace, uh, selling your apps on Atlassian Marketplace, but um, we both have a need to move our customers to the cloud. Let's see if we can run a hackathon now. Um, uh, I'm just not sure if everyone's run a hackathon. You're probably familiar with what it is, right? It's normally this thing where uh, you get people to co, you know, build something, uh, and there's not really a whole lot of guidance. The idea is to try and let people have that that free time that that enables innovation to flourish. Uh, and so normally it's easy to run from the perspective you don't have to give guidance, but in this case we've got a mission. And so how do we sort of get a hackathon working yet get the same results? And that was a bit of a problem. So what we tried to do here was come up with a a template of the goals of the hackathon and uh, sort of negotiate that with each of the developers, uh, vendors coming in for the week, um, which they sort of needed as well because they're flying in people from all parts of the world. One of the vendors flew people from Iceland all the way out to Sydney. And so they're obviously wanting to get commercial benefits from this. So we put this template together going, what do we want to get out of this and uh, align on that. And then as we went through the hackathon week, it enabled the teams to write things down as they remembered them. Uh, it also minimized them having to do documentation after the fact. And also towards the end of the week, it allowed a couple of us to actually go and speak to the uh, each of the vendors and sort of validate their needs in terms of what do we need to do to enable this this movement to cloud to work. Uh, so, um, so really, really sort of good way for us to to try and um, try and get the results. Um, you know, the, again, the, most of the time was uh, you know as you can see, this is a, a bit of a schedule. You know, we start the setup kickoff. You can see hackathon time, hackathon time, hackathon time, hackathon time. And that, that's what people wanted. You know, that, that sort of free time, uh, and then you know, moving towards capturing those outcomes in those templates, running a retro and the demos. That working software was the was the um, deliverable at the end of it. Um, now, one thing we tried to do here was, you know, again, I'd like to use that Kinefin framework here. This is a comp complicated problem. There's so many different apps. I think we have a thousand apps um, that are selling on Atlassian Marketplace. So many different apps, so many different ways they built, so many different ways they could migrate. Uh, so you've got that sort of, you know, it's the, did I catch the bullet train or the, or the plane sort of situation, but multiplied many, many times. And so what we did here was, was uh, look for subject matter experts from around the company, you know, people who knew workflows, who knew JQL really, really uh, deeply, uh, custom fields, the, the public API for Jira and Confluence, our support engineers who are having to work around this using manual um, uh, means. Um, and so just having those support bars there, again, we didn't know or know exactly what they did. We didn't go and do presentations to them. They were just there and available. And this was, that feedback was um, by far the, the highest bit of feedback that the participating developers said, now that was really useful because they had access to these experts um, on demand and that helped them figure out how to get their migration working, uh, which, was, which was fantastic. We did, did see successful demos. We ran it like a, a Atlassian style hackathon, which we call Ship It. And uh, you can see a, a trophy sitting down, down there. This was Tempo, they won the, the people's choice. We did a vote, had a voting system. So the peers voted them as the winner. And then we had Service Rocket here who were voted by the judges as the winner. Um, so a lot of fun, you know, we closed it with a retro and uh, it was an incredibly, not only was it a fun week, we actually, you know, within that week, we went from the situation of thinking this, this wasn't possible to actually having working demos from each of the vendors doing some part of their migration. So it really helped us validate how we're going to build a platform uh, to enable 
not just during conference to migrate, but also uh, bring the applications across from into cloud. Now, um, we like to use this word at Lassian called sparring, and it, it does come derived from you know, boxing or martial arts. It is that sort of thing where you gear up and you, you practice hitting each other, uh, but obviously in a safer environment. Uh, but the idea here is to really push each other. That's, that's the idea, uh, obviously without, without, um, <laughs> without destroying things. Um, you know, sort of, uh, again, push each other, challenge each other, push the boundaries as much as you can, learn together, grow up together, uh, and, and collaborate. Um, and we, you know, we use this word to mean, you know, it could be a, a short 30 minute whiteboard session. It could be a two hour workshop or in this example, a week long hackathon. Uh, but the, the learning I want to share from you here is like, try and look for opportunities to not just spar within the company amongst yourselves. Like it's great to sort of say we can spar and we can, uh, we can speak the truth to each other and, 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 and that, but, uh, having the customer in the room as we did with the, having the, the app vendors, which are the customers in this case, come in and spend time with us. Um, was hugely valuable. So try and look for those those opportunities for you to bring your customers into your uh, the sparring you have internally. Um, so that's a bit of a walk through some of the you know examples and frameworks uh, using the Agile Manifesto. Where do we go next with Agile? Um, you know, look, Agile is is there for software software development is becoming you know it's just going to get more and more uh, complex, right, and complicated with with what's going on there. We've, we've, especially as we move things into cloud, uh, yeah, the software there is now uh, you know talking to so many other systems in real time. It's connecting to other people through other, other software that's sitting in the cloud. There's so much functionality. You know, no, one, no one can actually read a manual anymore and get on top of the entire software as it is. And so it's, it's, it's no longer just this thing, this tech thing, I think, that we're, we're building. You know, it, it really is, um, you know, we use this term to mean cloud, you know, software as a service, but I sort of feel we should, like this is, why are we calling it as a service as if it's pretending the service? You know, software is, is doing things that um, in, in very intelligent ways. Uh, more so, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, the upcoming revolution in AI and those sort of things. It's really almost taking on that uh, that 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 personality, you know, that, that that thing that that a human would have would have um, would have rendered for you. Um, and so, there's a view that you know, if you sort of say, take that view that software is not just tech, it's not just code running around, and it's it's actually a service. Um, there's this, there's this view that the people are actually the product and service, you know, all the, the, the team culture, the, the attitudes, everything goes into uh, what you, what you're building. And that, that comes out as the way that service is going to be consumed or rendered for that, for that user. Um, and so I think it's that, that's a really important part to, to, to um, understand. I think when we, we think about where software I think is going and, and, and how can, what does agile need to do to respond to that? Um, and so, Coming back to that retro and Azure, I want to pick up on this this um, uh, this comment here by Michelle. You know, she's saying, hey, "I wish Agile was rebranded, renamed, so people don't assume it's working really fast without thinking." So this comes back to that you know that, the, the meaning of Agile sort of moving around a bit. Um, and but I really want to focus on this: work really hard without thinking. It's not about um, you know, uh, I guess, just trying to work efficiently. We need to to remember that Agile um, is is a lot more than that. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of talk in the, about you know lean methodologies and and I think ever all of us in our jobs have the responsibility to be you know um, uh, delivering efficiently, which is sort of the lean movement. Going okay, we can be super efficient, but what tends to happen with being efficient is you tend to and lean um, is that uh, you, it, it, it's easy to lose or, or you know sort of shoot for like minimum viable products that don't have a lot of stuff that excites customers. So getting this balance between Yes, being efficient, but also building something that your customers are absolutely going to love. Really tough thing to do. So how do we do that with Agile? I, I sort of uh, like to explain it in the, the sort of simple three three steps. Um, you know, Agile, as where it's come to right now from the 80s and early 2001 with the, the principles, uh, you know, those are, those are awesome. I, I do think they're going to be around for a while. Uh, you want to get into that iterative pattern with working software uh, and, you know, start with Scrum, as I mentioned, but go and find what works best for your team. That's sort of the, the, the bread and butter of Agile, the fundamentals. The next stage is typically then moving into this, this world where the team, the team becomes uh, really good at building and releasing software, great software. And so we've seen the movement where we started you know, coupling our Agile tracking systems with, with Git, uh, with DevOps, you know, the CI, CD practices that allow us to release fast and often and well. It's a little bit like fitness training but you know, releasing fast and often is not the end state. You know, that's uh, um, that that's a great internal metric, but 
is it what customers want? And so that's the third stage I like to call it here where, you know, we, we really want to uh, think about um, a definition of done moving from not just sprint completion or, cut or issue completion uh, or releases, but really looking, and, and those, are, those are a prerequisite to get to this stage where you can actually uh, try, and, try and do this, where you can iterate and validate value in the hands of customers. So it, may, it might mean things like your, your definition of done and your targets are now no, no longer, uh, you know, again, issues done or anything like that. It's, it's about a customer value metric or satisfaction metric that you've achieved uh, and really a symbol here of outcomes. The other thing that Agile hasn't really done or, or the framework of Agile like Scrum that hasn't called out is uh, how do you how do you work with design to again achieve that thing that people are going to really really love? And I think focusing on validating the, the the customer satisfaction measure of success is really important here. So that that sort of getting to this outcome phase is super important. Um, and there's a lot of talk in the industry I think at, at the moment about uh, about this reminding us that it's about outcomes over the outputs. Yeah, releasing often is is great, but again, are we actually getting what? Uh, is the customer getting, um, are we solving things for the customer in the, in the way that they need that? And I do think the Agile Manifesto has this in there. Um, I think, you know, when we talk through the examples and the meaning of these things, it, it does sort of try and place that, but it, it's, it's not super obvious, I think. And so either we can treat this like a, an unspoken principle or uh, I'll, just have, I'll just have a go on saying maybe we should add it as a fifth principle, a very easy one to remember, you know, outcomes over outputs. And I do think it helps with some of these big themes that you know we've, we've have come out of the retro and agile. You know, if, if we want, if we're losing the meaning of agile, bring it back to the outcomes. The outputs are, are less of a thing. Uh, you know, if if you're looking for opportunities for improvement, um, you know, again, focus on how we how we improve for the benefit of the customer and the outcomes, uh, as well as team health. So, um, we'll have a look at that. Um, I did get, actually in the retro and agile, we had the last one we did at the conference in Japan. I did have a customer ask about this. Uh, and so this presentation actually has a bit of, bit more uh, content than what I gave originally um, for the Retro and Agile at, at Developer Summit in Tokyo. Uh, and what I've done is add a few more examples here to talk about how do you, uh, if we were to call, call this a new principle, what are some things that I can share with you as to what we've done in, with the teams I've worked with. So um, again, we want to be in a position of working software. We have to be there with, with, with that in front of customers using it in an unbiased environment for real with their data. Um, uh, we've, we've used things like beta, um, opt-in labs in our products in the past. Uh, this is quite a well-known thing in the industry. I think Gmail probably popularized this by having Gmail and beta for so long. So you're probably familiar with this where we release something early with the expectation that, Hey, this thing's still evolving and could change. And in this case, we, we allow customers to check box them. So they were actually opting into that early release feature. Um, the next two are probably something more interesting and they're, they're, they're something that I can sort of take you behind the scenes and show you some numbers and how we, how we um, uh, tried and tried and uh, work in this, this sort of outcomes fashion or, or in the pursuit of outcomes. Um, so this is, this usability opt-in um, system was, was, was something we used to bring in a very large uh, user experience change. Now very large user experience changes. You know, we, we design, we do a lot of research and design, speak to a lot of customers and we, I'd, I'd like to say we, we are definitely advancing the product, but, usability changes come with a, a cost on the user, particularly for our products that are productivity tools. You know, you've got something to do this week, not necessarily uh, have the time to deal with the change that we're trying to do and, and upgrade your experience. So um, so this usability opt-in is this sort of thing that tries to do two things. It helps us iterate and find that, that out, outcome sort of metric that we're trying to go towards, but also help customers adjust to a new feature as we roll it out, particularly in uh, UI. Um, so this brings us back to when we were, we, uh, were developing um, the uh, Jira software 7.0. We, um, at the time before that, we had, you'd buy Jira as a bug tr issue tracker, bug tracker, and then you'd add Agile on as a plugin on top from the Atlassian marketplace. And so if you went to a Jira project, this is the kind of experience you'd see. And we're like, hey, do we, how do we improve this? When we look at our analytics, we were observing about 70% of people were clicking through into the projects, going to the issues, Clicking on all issues, which takes you to this place we call the issue navigator, um, pretty much issue, issue search. Uh, and so there's a school of thought going, hey, if so many people are wanting to get to the issues in their projects, why don't we improve that experience of, of seeing your issues in your projects? Further, further along, you'd see this tab called Agile. Now at the time, Agile was, uh, uh, again, it was a plugin, but we we're finding that over 70% of our Jira customers were buying this Agile plugin. So a lot of value in terms of uh, and validation that people are getting value because they're paying for it. 
And um, also there were some great reviews about it and it introduced the boards where you can visualize your work in progress. But you come to your project here, click on Agile, and you, could actually, you couldn't actually find your board here, although it gave you some information about it. So not great integration in terms of, uh, you know, what does a Jira project mean with the new Agile functionality? So there were two schools of thoughts, right? Well, we said, let's go to the project and let's make it uh, a great issue experience. That's what the, the data is saying. Uh, yet on our product vision and strategy, we're sort of looking at that and going, look, people love the board, the visualization of work. It's got the, the new Agile features, the world's going Agile. Um, and so we we're spinning our wheels arguing about this, uh, which is the better experience for, for quite some time. And I can tell you there's actually, there are actually more uh, permutations of this, more different designs that we were, we were really spinning our wheels on. So what we did was say, look, let's, let's figure out a way we can get our customers in to help us make this decision. And so that's where the usability opt-in framework came in. You would be asked if you want to try out the new experience and you would come from, say if you came from a board, you'd only see the board, which is on the, on the right there. And you would come into here and get this new sidebar, which introduced uh, how you would you know, use the other features of the project as a whole. And as you can see that it's, it's very similar to how Jira is now. This is an earlier, earlier design that we tested. And further down on that sidebar, you can see uh, this, this thing here saying, hey, you're trying the new sidebar navigation projects, tell us what you think, uh, or you can go back to the old design. And so we wanted people to come in, look at it, try it out, and actually go back to the old design, look at that, and then come back in. You know, If you clicked to go back, it would also show you how to come back to this new experience. And what we wanted people to go in and out, and really what would happen is the one that they settled on would tell us that that's the one that they prefer. Um, also, when they decided to go back, that's the point when we captured feedback. So when they clicked on, you know, let me out, I want to go back. Uh, this is not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for whatever's going on. Uh, we pop up a form, which is powered by a feature in Jira called the issue collector. So the form, you'd fill out a bit of feedback. It would create an issue. This is the back end of the project. You can see all the issues created from the feedback when people clicked out, and that would give us, you know, some really good feedback as to why people were rejecting the new experience. Now, the good thing with this as well is um, it's, a, it's a, in Jira a filter, a JQL filter, and you can save this and you can subscribe to it. You can tell it, hey, email me uh, the latest, the change in the last day, week, whatever's going on. So a lot of the team members at the time decided to subscribe daily. So each time they'd come into the office, they'd read uh, feedbacks coming in the last day and uh, really look at that and actually go in and make changes that would improve and respond to that feedback uh, almost immediately. Um, now, this is the uh, sort of rollout results, uh, you know, a number of, um, as you can see, iterations here. And if you look at the very first row there, uh, the initial rollout on the far right, the opt-out rate was 22%. So not, not very good, right? We're getting about 22% of the people reject the new experience and go, ah, this isn't ready. It's not working for me. Um, but as you can see, over time, we, we iterated on that using that feedback. And as you can see, we got it down to a really good uh, position there, 5.4%. Uh, of, of people saying, you know, opting back out. And that included people who are just like, look, I've just done the time today. So pretty good, pretty good um, position to be in. Um, now, what I, want to, I do want to mention here that actually trying to do this opt-in and opt-out experience, it, the team, it took a while for the team to actually uh, get to like it. Firstly, it was seen as a tax, an upfront tax of building the system that will get thrown away. We're spending two weeks, even four weeks, I think, from memory doing this. And I was asked, why are we doing this? You know, it's just, it's going to get thrown away. But as you can see, over the time, the team could actually respond to that feedback and actually see success in increasing over time. Uh, it also um, brought in this mechanism that allowed people to, you know, opt out, right? So um, I remember going to a stand-up and, and one of the team members saying, hey, um, you know, we're, we're wondering whether we should try this thing or not. And they'll say, hey, we've got the safety of an opt-out. And it was sort of at that moment, everyone looked around and said, yeah, actually, we can, we can actually be a bit bolder with the changes here, knowing that the customer could just, you know, if, go back to what they're doing right now if we didn't get it right. Um, so I think, I think that combination of iteration and this, this whole system and that safety of having an opt-in, opt-out enabled the team to really march forward. And so by JIRA 6.4, so remember, this was time of JIRA 6.3, by 6.4, we actually launched this still with the opt-in there and we achieved a, a rejection rate of less than 5%, better, better than any of our, our sort of iterations uh, in the lead up development work. Um, and so the biggest um, learning from here was, was, was actually setting that goal of not being, let's get the sidebar done and, and the, the design done. We actually use that opt-in rate as a measure of customer satisfaction as our goal, as our signal to say, are we, are we actually on, on track? Are we done? Are we ready or not? Um, and so, 
we, we were able to release this because we knew that less than 5% of people, around 5% of people were um, opting out. Um, as I mentioned as well, they, they, they included people not ready, so they could have liked it, they're just busy. Um, a really good spot. And this, I actually had budget in this, this project to actually run it all the way to JIRA 7.0. So we saved about six to eight months uh, um, or, or launched it quicker. So again, focusing on outcomes over outputs, um, you know, moral of the story here is not only you build the right thing, um, in this case, it also helped us build the right thing faster. Um, experiments is another mechanism that we use. Um, you know, the usability opt-ins are great, but they're, they're reserved for very large changes. If you run too many usability opt-ins, it, it can annoy customers, right? There's so many things going on, so many things changing. Experiments are great. You can run them faster. You, you're, um, they're like sort of blind Coke Pepsi tests, you know, like which one tastes better. Don't, and so that's the thing. You don't tell the customer you run an experiment, which can be very annoying. Uh, if we move buttons around and stuff when you're trying to do your work. So we tend to reserve these experiments for uh, onboarding. So people new to Jira, we've run, we've used experiments quite successfully there because they're starting, everything is more or less new. They're not in the middle of their work. And when you start Jira, um, or we, the reason we went after this problem, we, get, we got told a lot of the time, look, Jira is great, it's powerful, but it's very hard to get going. And one of the things you do when you start Jira is you come in and you choose a template. Uh, so if you look at Jira software, the, the primary templates are Scrum software and Kanban software, there's two different, two key templates for, for Agile there. And what we did in this experiment was simply randomize the placement of these templates. Uh, and what we, what you can see there in the control group and experiment group, those who, where we leave the control groups where they are normally in an experiment group is all randomized. You can see there's a, a massive movement in who's choosing Scrum and Kanban, which tells us people are not making conscious decisions. They're not actually looking at it and going, oh, I want Kanban or, or Scrum. Um, and funny enough, told us as well, most people just click on the top left thing. So of course we didn't ship this, it doesn't deliver any customer value, it probably would actually annoy people, but what it does is show us, it tells us that we need to help people make a decision between starting with Scrum or Kanban. And so we went back to the drawing board with this kind of problem and, um, and uh, what we did was, hey look, there's a lot of people inside the company running you know, with agile experience, why don't we ask them? Hey, if a customer asks you, should I do Scrum or Kanban? Uh, well, what questions would you ask? And so internally on Confluence, we'd, we'd put this question up there. All these people came up with, with, um, with questions they'd ask customers. And then we turn it into this design. Uh, as you can see, you sort of fill in the blanks of this sentence. So my team is new to, or the other option would have been uh, to, uh, I'm experienced in our agile methodologies. We spend time, uh, most of our time working on the other selections of features, uh, support bug fix, and we will rely on a tight or flexible schedule. And depending on what you answered, uh, we would then, uh, return a, a, a recommendation and um, yeah this this experiment actually has given us probably it's probably one of our most successful experiments great created quite a quite a big in, increase in um, ongoing uh, usage of uh, the project because you know again setting up uh, getting getting on the right template is, and setting up in the right way is, is quite critical to um, to how you're going forward so again hopefully a few few examples there which is how you you know the, these are the sort of complex type problems as you can see with the experiments the op usability opt-in where you know, we, we think we have the design sorted out in R&D and then you throw something into the system and change it and some, you know, some, some other insight comes out and that's how we actually ended up finding our way to actually solving the problem. Um, so a couple of examples there for outcomes over outputs. Um, that brings me towards the end of the presentation. Um, I just do want to say, leave, leave, leave a few closing remarks about, you know, Agile does thrive in, in open environments. You really want to have um, as much openness as you can, as you've seen in some of the examples within the company. Uh, as well as with with customers, really, really, really important that customers understand um, understand that. Um, I, I do think when when I get asked, you know, how does Atlassian do Agile? The, there's no one answer. There's so many different uh, team examples. Um, you could probably ask me to come back and I can give you more as well. There's, we have so many different ways of doing Agile. There's no one way of um, well, you can do Agile of of you know, sort of applying Agile and being an Agile team. There's no there's no set process, right? Um, and so I think our values have, is the thing that's helped, you know, it's, it's just sort of helped us um, try and try and make that an open environment. And by sharing that openly, just you know, again, huge, huge thanks and very, very um, thankful to our customers that, you know, been able to also embrace this and be very open with us to tell us what, what needs you have so that we can try and do our best to, to make the products that you need and help you go on and, and deliver amazing software. So I um, hope you've, hope you've um, learned a few things or if not, you know, um, uh, had, um, it, it might have uh, just reaffirmed some things that you already knew. Hopefully you can take some of these things to your team and, and help you sort of with, uh, with your, um, your agile teams and, and how, how you're going, going about 
shipping some amazing software. Really looking forward to, to you all putting your talents into the software you're making and, and what you're going to deliver next. Uh, but again, thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, just uh, if, if you've got any questions, happy to stay around and take those as well. Thank you, Jason. This was a really a great presentation. I enjoyed, uh, you know, the, talking about Agile is such a complex process, which seems really easy. But, uh, you know, you talked about a lot of aspects like, you know, wearing a T-shirt uh, saying I'm Agile does not make you Agile. It's the process end to end and you need to, you know, start it and then uh, take it home like slowly and steadily, you need to be agile rather than saying, you know, uh, I do scrum or I'm agile, I'm doing agile. That's really great. Uh, some of the slides that I really like was the Pokemon one, uh, gotta catch them all. <laughs> that was great. And uh, I saw the, cr the cricket one and people got excited in the chat looking at the cricket <laughs> slide. So that was great. I really enjoyed the presentation and uh, it would have been great if you know you were here and we were doing this in person. Uh, in Gurgaon, we used to do a really uh, collaborative and interactive sessions, and uh, it was always a meetup. Uh, we preferred always a meetup rather than doing it on uh, online. But you know the times have changed. We have to do it like this. But we will love to have you in the coming years here and uh, taking this presentation in person. I would have said that we'll surely meet in the summit, but that's not happening. So <laughs> anytime, I mean, uh, that's I'm not uh, making any plans. But that would be uh, it. Would be great to have you in person. So uh, yeah, do that. I was um, actually did visit our India office back in December actually, and I had to oh, that's great. Back, um, yeah, um, definitely will be in India. So next time around, I'll, I'll swing by Delhi. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That would be great. And I want to thank Tamanna also. Tamanna uh, is the community manager uh, for APAC. She helped uh, me connect with you. Uh, thank you, Tamanna, for doing that. I mean, that was really helpful. And uh, we have the Noida leaders as well. I see Deepak. Uh, thank you, Deepak, for your uh, collaboration as well. And uh, I will say the stage is open, guys. If you have any questions uh, you want to ask directly to Tamanna, Jason, or us, please go ahead, uh, unmute yourself and ask the question right away. Uh, hi, Jason. Uh, so I have one question. Uh, so uh, we have been doing Agile for a pretty long time. And Your voice is breaking, people. Can you just fix the mic a little bit? Uh, is it better now? Yeah, yes, it's better. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, we are doing agile practices for, uh, for a long period of time and we are a product company. And sometimes what happens is uh, we have built a product that we don't want, actually wanted, uh, like customers are not happy with these uh, ideas, uh, what we have shipped so far. And we have to take down these products, uh, these uh, portion of the products uh, from it. So what are your ideas on uh, it? Like, how do you do that uh, at a class? And for example, you have shipped something and um, many people didn't like it. So how do you take it down? All right. Um, yeah, good. Very good question. Um, I mean, that I, I sort of see, uh, I, I sort of mentioned the working software elements, you know, great software team saying, you know, working software is the best measure of progress. I I mentioned when I, I put out roadmaps, I will, I will have a, always, always have that getting into the customer's hands as fast as soon as possible because that that's the point when you really understand if you're on the right track or not and uh, typically that the hard part of that is trying to figure out um, how how do you get enough people into that we call them early access programs now how, enough people to get in there to get the right feedback to know if you're on the right track um, but they're not too many so that you sort of get too many people to come in and, and they're going hey this is not ready because uh, obviously you're, you're 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 still way off from from finishing the uh, or, or getting to a, um, a a a rich feature set, um, and so I think yeah, uh, a early access programs are great. Um, you know, I've seen many many things work well in some previous companies I've worked at. I used to work at, at Yahoo about over ten years ago, and one product we had there, Flickr, had had a very good um, uh, private beta um, system running. You know, it, it sort of um, There'd be there'd be a number of really passionate customers, you know, really having that 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 um, fanatical audience trying to find them who are really into your product, who really uh, care about the product and would would spend time giving it a thorough test and giving you you know um, honest and critical feedback. Um, so those sort of things, I think, um, 
work really well to just quickly validate your idea. And, but again, I, I, I always try and put a preference in for that to be in the working software, not just a, a paper exercise. Um, I, I know there is a, there are the, the, those things can help accelerate. I'm not saying that they're not they're not as useful, but you know once you've once you've committed to building, um, at some point you've got to get in front of a customer. So um, you know, getting getting that out there and then quickly understanding if that's the right thing or to stop. You know, I think that's that's probably the 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 the, the, the best advice I could give is like, yeah, how could you get it out as soon as possible and and course correct and but also you know sort of get the, the trick is getting the right audience um at, at that point in time um other other things would be i guess you know you'd want to have um a good a good a good grasp of what you feel the job to be done is uh that 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 works for the business how does a business be commercially viable as well as what the customer um is the customer getting value because obviously that if they don't they, they won't be um paying for the product um, so a good, good sort of, you know, what is, what is the key metric that is your, your, in your product release that you're sort of saying is going to be the, the indicator of that, that customer satisfaction, that value, that, that sort of outcome example I gave there where we're measuring acceptance of this feature, um, you know, uh, as a, as a black and white measure of like, look, they, they could have gone back to the old thing, but they didn't, they stayed with the new ones. So they're obviously voting and saying the new thing is, is better. So you want to have. A, a good sense that and those metrics that is a bit of an art you've got to try and apply that to every different projects um a bit of a pro product management talk i could probably give on that in terms of you know jobs we've done other examples but that's sort of the thing as well there's also having having that sort of uh what does success look like in terms of customer outcomes okay oh jason this is srikan here can i ask a question jason sure. yeah jason uh, it's a good presentation uh, first question is, uh, is it a Jira uh, planning to have a, a support uh, safe in the sense uh, full extent uh, uh, in the safe all the part uh, when the PA planning plot, part, the PPA planning plot, uh, part or uh, even the management side uh, program, portfolio management, these things, uh, Jason? Oh, all right. I, I don't think I can answer that anymore because I, 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 I was the Head, uh, lead product manager for Jira Software for about five years, but I, I've moved to the cloud platform team now, um, so I don't have the answer right now. I can get back to you on that. We we had we have um, a couple of things that uh, have uh, prob probably probably lean towards um, very likely. Um, if, if you look at the the way we've we've developed Jira Software, Jira Agile, they were very team centric, right? So they're very project you get a project centric sort of experience going on the, the Agile boards, uh, run your sprints. Uh, but we, we'd always had feedback from customers around, yeah, like how do I get visibility across projects? Uh, how do I run safe, uh, agile at scale okay. Okay. kind of things? Right? So we we have introduced products like Portfolio to the mix. Okay. In, we acquired Portfolio. We used to be a, a plugin called um, Roadmaps to Jira, and that's that's evolved over time. We now have um, Portfolio 3.0 that has now been packaged into Jira Software Premium as advanced roadmaps. We also acquired. Um, uh, a company that is now we've turned into um, uh, Jira Align. So Jira Align has, I do believe it does have those sort of safe features, but I'll, I'll probably need to get back to you with, with the official word on that. Um, but I, I, I would say directionally, the, yes, we, we will most likely have um, solutions there for Scaled Agile uh, as, we, as we've evolved this, this, uh, the tooling out there for, for Agile, um, not just teams, but organizations at scale. Uh, thanks, Jason. Maybe one follow-up question. It's uh, not a question sort of thing. Uh, somehow, uh, I felt uh, not only I, a lot of people, uh, Jira always says issue ID, issue ID. Uh, issue is, uh, the word is giving a negative connotation uh, instead of issue, something like a challenge because everyone, uh, since Jira has started uh, using issue, issue, in fact, required, even for the requirement as a Jira ID says issue ID, so it giving a negative connotation in, in even uh, in a project discussion or whatever. Uh, this is my issue, my issue, your issue. Uh, is that any? Uh, I feel very uncomfortable. Not only me, a lot of people. It's a fact putting a challenge or requirement ID, uh, something where uh, because people start using uh, picking from the uh, Jira and that even the Excel sheet or even emailing while talking, they are using the negative word called issue. Actually, it's a challenge even a defect to certain extent we can call as an issue but when you're uh, 
uh, developing some software or you know even doing some challenges the, the client challenges only we are coming in, taking as a requirement and doing a, a project uh, I, you know this is uh, not uh, you can decide but uh, is there any any thoughts on that yeah i look uh, i yes we have we have um we have that challenge yeah it, it is from the bug issue tracking days um, yeah i understand okay so, so the, the word has sort of stuck around and become um part of the lingo um but i i i've i've spoken to customers who have expressed the same concern actually one customer said he he uses the word concern now not oh, issue. Okay. Um, and how could they customize that so I have seen Jira server customers completely override the uh, the language um, pack um, as one way to do it. I, I think you know. I think when, when we develop next gen projects, we also looked at that and said, look, how can we help people, um, you know, apply their own terminology as well. Uh, and I think that I think that's sort of probably where we'd need to get to. Like, how could we give you the ability to create your own terminology if that fits better with your the lingo of your your business? Um, you see things like in NextGen where you can you can change Epic and call it whatever you want now. So in our older, you know, classic projects that came from Jira Agile, you'd, you'd be forced to call them Epic and subtask an issue. Um, so uh, may, maybe in the future there might there might be a bit more you know, of that flexibility to to call them something different. Um, I think I think at the moment it's a bit of a hard one to move straight away just because it's, it's so ingrained. I, I mean, I get I get things like Jet, like Jira Service Desk. You know, people tend to call them tickets as well. So trying to find the the universal word for that thing that can mean ticket and issue and story. Um, I think the issue type is sort of the thing that might be you know the 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 way to you know the way to sort of talk about what kind of work that is. Is it a task? Is it a, a story? That sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I don't have a straight answer for you here. I, I think the, the word has sort of gotten away as the, the, the thing in the dictionary for it to mean something. And uh, I, yeah, I, I think the best thing is if we could figure out a way to maybe allow you to, to you know, fit, fit the thing sitting inside of Jira settings to match the terminology of your business. Yeah, uh, I think the, it's all started come, uh, Jira started initially as a bug tracking tool uh, uh, while, so, but what, what I feel is now, we have gone beyond the bug tracking, even a bigger projects uh, they're executing uh, using Jira. So if you tell, or if we call as a issue, issue, some people will feel one is negative and they will think uh, the level of software only, only for the issue tag tracking or only for the ticket tracking uh, thing. Instead of that work type, like that's something we can change. It will look like uh, much better. I thought uh, the suggestion for it, but an uh, excellent presentation. Your examples are good. Uh, it's really a good one hour session. On behalf of all the people attending, thanks a lot. You made uh, things very simple and thanks a lot once again. Thanks, uh, uh, Jason, for your commitment and uh, good presentation. Uh, all right, yeah, Thank, thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, that's really sweet. <clears throat> Anybody else have yeah. a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, guys. Let's keep it. Uh, uh, I mean, simple questions because uh, yeah, we don't want uh, the session to go on forever. So, see, simple yeah. questions for Jason. Hey, Jason, how are you? I'm. I'm sure you are staying safe this pandemic. Anyways, okay. But my question is, I, I know this is off the hook, but uh, I just I would like to know: Is there any uh, add-ons like organize? I just saw an article uh, mentioning organize uh, uh, for uh, you know capacity planning. So, do we have any any kind of such add-ons in in uh, in pipeline? Uh, capacity planning is a feature of Jira of portfolio for Jira. So you can you can put down capacity planning, and it it, it, it you can note down, you know, which team members on holiday, and it, it will augment your your uh, your burn down charts and those things in the way Jira software out of the box doesn't do that, right? It just it just looks at your average three past three sprint velocity mm -hmm. as your as as you look forward, but. Um, portfolio does have a feature where you can, it will do that as well as uh, it will also look at, yeah, again, who's on holiday. Um, it, it, you can even set things like who's front end, back end skill and, and sort of divide the work by by that as well. So, um, so Jira portfolio, I'd say, you know, now it's, we have, we've evolved that into portfolio 3.0 in server and that functionality is also now in, in Jira cloud in, in advanced roadmaps. But I didn't find it in the marketplace, at least in marketplace. It, I didn't, I couldn't find it. Are you looking for cloud or or, or um, yeah yeah for the cloud? So in cloud, it, it, this this is a very recent change. Uh, I think it was okay. only a month ago. 
okay. where we, we it's no longer a, a Jira portfolio add-on or app in cloud. It's actually bundled. It comes with Jira Software Premium. Okay. Okay. If you go to the Jira Software Premium edition, you'll see all that all that functionality sure, bundled. Sure. Thanks. And I really liked your example. I mean, all of them, but uh, the one that I that strikes me was uh, McDonald's fries. It was simple and to the to the point. Yeah. Thanks. No worries. You're right, guys. Hi, Jason. Uh, Surya, the side. Uh, thanks for those uh, you know beautiful insights on, on the deck there. Uh, and thanks to Manna for uh, for organizing and helping the community. Uh, you know, just just uh, you know organize this session with Jason. Uh, Jason, uh, this is around. Uh, so, in in your past experiences uh, and and working at Atlassian, can you share some insights related to uh, the work which you have been able to you know gather from the customer feedbacks and any metrics which you have been able to pull off uh, in in your uh, you know product management experience? Uh, because I know at at Atlassian, you guys do a lot of OKR sort of thing. So, like at a metrics level or a key result level, have you like? In your in your experience, have you set some key results alongside uh, you know measuring those customer feedbacks or or so in in my experience, what we have what we have faced is that at times we have to just you know drop off some products out of out of out of our kitty uh, because we are not able to get the right kind of feedback from the customers at times because of the bandwidth crunch and all this stuff. So anything uh, related to that, uh, if you can share some insights there. Sure, sure. Um. <clears throat> I have got a talk which which has touches on this. I, I um, uh, there's sort of three three area when I put a roadmap together. It's sort of uh, I have a th simple three three. Well, there's lots of frameworks, but this this framework has three elements to it. So, be, staying on top of what customers want, and that's really just making sure you're on top of all the literal feedback people give a, give you, um, right? So we have we have lots of examples like Jira.atlassian.com where you can create a ticket, put a feature request on. Uh, you've got a lesson community where you can go put things on. There's there's so many different channels. Like people even even might submit things on Twitter. Um, so the idea there is you're just trying to get literally what a customer is saying. I need this. I need this. I need this. And and trying to trying to get some volume and 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 sense of that around there. Um, the second part of this this framework is then also um, being on top of I guess what I'd sort of, sort of say is sort of like unspoken needs. So it's a little bit like um, uh, the 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 part where I mean, in any product, you are um, you would need at some stage to to be become sort of um, recognised as an industry leader or, or, or expert or uh, saying saying the example of Jira Software, you're like a coach, right? So, um, or I think I think we like the cricket example. So you like the cricket coach, the the, the batter can't see the, where they're swinging inaccurately, maybe because they can't see what they're doing. So you see a lot of people video themselves or or the coaches. That's what the coach is there for. So you've got the coach element going. Okay. Um, you know, we 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 specialize in this product for this market. Um, here's what we're going to recommend to our customers to do an awesome job, whatever it is that you're doing. And then the third dimension is balancing um, the commercial side of things, right? Like, what is the company goal? And you've got to balance that because uh, it's one thing to sort of try and pick a a nice uh, goal that you want to go after, but if if you can't sustain that commercially, you can't build a product. So those sort of three things is sort of just to wrap that up. Literally, what customer says. You as an expert or as a coach, what, what do you think the customer needs? And then that, that business element there. Um, lots of different things coming through. I would say we've tried things like NPS. I think that's quite a popular one out in the marketplace. You pop, pop up a random survey. Hey, how, how, would, how likely would you be to recommend this product to others? Uh, and I think that's a, it's a great uh, um, measure of advocacy, right? Like, you know, is this person going to say, um, you know, would they be fanatical about? Will they run around on the street saying, "Hey, you should use this. You know, I really want to show you this product." Um, you know, Apple's sort of famous for that sort of thing. That you know, people want to get want to show you their new watch, whatever's going on. Um, and and so NPS is sort of good for that. But uh, what I've found with NPS, and I have I have had this shared from from other sort of growth hackers I've met in, in Silicon Valley, and that talking about NPS being a really hard one then to go and gold the team on. So we can we can grab an NPS and go, okay, NPS is here trying to move that NPS from like 70 to 80, that's something I've not seen any teams do successfully, to be honest. Um, so it, I think I think what I've taken from that is NPS is a great measure to get a strategic sense of like, hey, because you'll read all that feedback and go, look, I don't, I'm finding your product is slow. I'm finding it too hard to use. Uh, I'm finding it um, doesn't, doesn't integrate with other, you know, whatever it comes from. So you'll pick a theme 
But when you go after that theme, you've then got to interpret it to this, this thing I was talking about today about the outcomes. What's the job to be done of that thing that you've, you've, picked, you've picked to go after and, um, uh, and then apply it to, the, to that sort of thing. Um, and so, I mean, to, to break from an Atlassian, give, give Atlassian examples of break. What I did hear, for example, from, from Uber was they looked at that and said, look, their, their goal there is trying to increase number of rides Right, so this is now moving into an area where you're trying to find that that job to be done metric. Going, look, if we increase increase rides that are being transactioned on, you've got this two sided marketplace that matches their business model, um, and and uh, you know tracks more drivers, tracks more riders, and you you keep growing that sort of thing. So that's that's sort of an interesting one where um, you know you could take an NPS from Uber, but then like they would then probably break that down and go, okay, well um, you're probably trying to trying to aim for an NPS increase. The only place I've seen that work is probably like a, a call center, which is more about the, the attitude and the treatment of the customer rather than the substance of the product. So, um, so yeah, so that, I mean, there's various different ways to look at that. Um, one thing I've, I've always done is a, a method. It's a bit more of a design. I've learned this more from designers rather than product managers where we try and pick, pick the key personas and be quite precise about who are our key personas. So if you think about when I was doing Jira software, we had, uh, um, you know, sort of the scrum personas of the scrum master, the product owner and the, the developer. And then we map the, their workflow out, you know, fit, like physically on a big wallboard that we printed out in the office. Um, and, uh, yeah, we look at their tasks and what they're actually doing. You know, they're grooming a backlog, they're setting the story points, someone's prioritizing it, then they go and kick, kick the thing off and then you're in sprint mode. You finish the sprint, you're in release mode. After you release, you're in a set, you're in, you're in a, um, analytics assessing sort of the impact sort of thing. So we put that up on the on the board, and then when we when we find you know highly voted tickets on jira.lassen.com, one of the issues has a lot of votes on it. We can sort of map that onto that that end to end visualization. Um, we can can grab other bits of feedback and try and amalgamate it into this this journey. And that that was sort of one way we could um, you know I, I think that worked for like when you're looking at at usability improvements. We got a lot of feedback you now that the product's a bit compl complicated to use. Um, cause that then gave us that sort of map, if you like to go, Hey, here's the vision for like how we could support the way, the way teams typically do scrum, you know? So, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to present that sometime. I do. I, I do sure, 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 sure. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. That, that is, that's really helpful. And thanks for those insights. Thank you once again for that beautiful presentation today. Thank you. Thanks right. everyone. Right. I guess uh, we have spent a lot of time. Uh, people don't want uh, you to go. They have so many questions. So <laughs> I think we, we should do this again uh, anytime. I mean, uh, people have a lot of questions. You can, you know, reach out to Jason uh, directly or let's gather our questions and then do a Q&A session whenever Jason is free. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for this session, again, thank you everyone for coming in on a Sunday. Thank you, Jason, for uh, being patient with the, all, all the questions and a wonderful presentation again. I have recorded this uh, session and uh, there's a dedicated channel there where we post all the uh, uh, sessions that we re uh, record. I'll post that. I hope you're comfortable with that, Jason. Uh, if you yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay, great. So uh, that's it for today, guys. Uh, have a very nice Sunday. Be safe. And thank you again, everyone, for joining. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Jason. Thank you, everyone.